Hello from the Faculty of Arts Library at the University of Malta. I'm Jean-Paul De Luca from the Department of Philosophy. Welcome to this event which uh, we are organizing as a department together with the National Book Council of Malta as part of the uh, Campus Book Festival, which this year, for reasons that need not be explained, is being held virtually. The event we're, we're organizing today features two guests, um, uh, Enrico Pannai and Francois Amit, who I will introduce uh, shortly. We're going to be looking at the relationship between philosophy and AI and in, in information and technology and especially looking at the ethical side of that discussion. So our uh, guest is Enrico Panay, who is connected with us virtually from, from France. Enrico um, is a human information um, interaction specialist and an AI ethicist. He taught for several years as an adjunct professor at the University of Sassari in the Department of philosophy there, and then he moved to France in 2007, and there he has consulted uh, several large corporations on his area of expertise, that is, the AI and the ethical uh, side of uh, artificial intelligence. Um, he studied cybersecurity awareness at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Security and uh, Justice at the École Militaire de Paris, and he is currently a senior fellow for of For Humanity, a non-profit association that is dedicated to the development of an independent audit of, for artificial intelligence. He has various research interests, and uh, these include cyber geography, cyber wars, information ethics, cyber security, and human information interaction. I should also say that Enrico was a visiting scholar at our department last year. Unfortunately, he had to cut his visit short when the pandemic broke out just a a year ago, but we're actually looking forward to uh, seeing him again here in, in Malta. In the meantime, we have to make do with having him with us virtually for this event, and we're very happy to have him uh, in conversation with uh, Francois Zamit. Francois is a doctoral student at, uh, in our department, but he has also a long ex uh, experience in the education sector. Um, so thank you, Francois, for joining us for this conversation. Um, the, the, the subject is uh, that of, as I said before, philosophy and artificial intelligence. Uh, if we take a very basic uh, description of what philosophy is at, as a discipline, we could say that philosophy asks fundamental questions about all areas of human activity. And even if we are looking at artificial intelligence, what we're looking at is precisely how human beings interact with, besides creating, um, uh, machines, programs, artificial intelligence. So the first question, and this will be the, just to start off the discussion and the conversation that will actually be between Enrico and Francois, my, the first question is, if you could uh, um, tell us what you think the relationship between philosophy and artificial intelligence is. I'll, perhaps we can start with Enrico and then pass on to Francois. Uh, thank you very much, Jean-Paul. And happy to be here again uh, with you in Malta again virtually. And uh, uh, to answer uh, your question, uh, it's uh, artificial intelligence and philosophy are uh, connected more than we think actually. Because uh, artificial intelligence is now changing our way to see the world. Uh, the philosophical world will be is trying to re-ontologize the world. Everything is changing in our relationship with uh, the reality. Uh, we must use to understand the problem a precise uh, level of abstraction. It means that uh, uh, now we live in a period where there is a deluge of information and we are in a period called the uh, era of zettabyte. And with all these data, uh, we have to cope with. And how we can cope with a lot of data, the only way is to use the right instruments that could help to manage all this data. And when I'm talking about a lot of data, 
just to give you an example, um, in we one only one zettabyte, it corresponds at about a hundred eight million uh, library of the uh, Congress uh, of Washington. So it's a lot of data, and one zettabyte uh, is uh, is less than we what we have at the moment. At the moment, we passed the fifty. Mm, zettabyte, and we are going to a new era that is the Yotabyte. It's an enormous amount of uh, data that should be treated, uh, stocked somewhere, and should be transformed in information. And just to have an idea of what we are going to uh, to manage and to store a Yotabyte, uh, we will need a uh, hundred trillion dollars. And if you think that the GDP uh, of the world is only sixty-one trillion dollar uh, trillion dollars, then you understand how much uh, we need artificial intelligence to manage all this data. And uh, just another idea: to stock all this data, we need uh, uh, quite twenty-five times the island of Malta transformed into a data uh, center. It's uh, something enormous. Now, what is changing this uh, uh, with uh, our perception of the world? It changes because artificial intelligence is uh, giving an interpretation of data. When we are talking of data, we are talking of several kinds of data, uh, personal data, uh, data that help us to identify somebody. But there are two kinds of data that are quite dangerous. The proxy data that uh, help us to, uh, to understand who is somebody using another information. Uh, for example, if you see um, uh, the uh, the rainbow flag, you can imagine that the person is uh, can, uh, a, a, somebody near to the LGBT uh, movement, or the inferences. And the inferences that are data but not fact are uh, datizing our data subject, has our subject, in a new world, in this world of data in the infosphere. And while it's transforming us uh, in, uh, in uh, fact that in data that no, are not fact, uh, all the machine are trying to treat us like somebody we are not. So it's really important the, the relation that philosophy should have with AI for its power, its poetic power, to redesign the reality. Philosophers should help the new technology to design, design again the reality in a better way. So I think that Francois. Yes, um, what we need to think of is it's very important. There are two strands of philosophy that are related to technology. We can say that there's a philosophy of technology, which is about how technology should function, it looks into the design of technology, and it's more about the, the, the development of technology. And then we have philosophy on technology or about technology, which looks at um, the effects of technology on uh, reality and on society. So it looks at it in terms of ethics, politics, and as Henrico correctly said, with AI, it's not just about these human phenomena, but it's actually about the redefinition of what makes us human ourselves. All right, it's the ontology. It's it looks it is changing our ontology, our behavior, the way we actually uh, interpret the world and the way we behave. Uh, case in point, we can look at, for example, uh, the new AI developments in countries like China, where we have um, biometrics 3.0, as it's being called where it's not only about facial recognition, but it's also about emotional recognition. And we have companies who are promoting this kind of technology, 
where they are literally making inferences about um, how someone might behave, all right? So we're looking at, if people remember the book by Philip K. Dick, Minority Report, or maybe the movie Minority Report, where people were arrested before they actually committed a crime, this is something similar, what's happening with these kind of um, new forms of biopower, we need these new forms of um, disciplinary power, where literally um, there is a reading of emotions. How will this person react? And it is being used by Chinese authorities in prisons, on the roads, and nowadays even more worrying even in schools. The idea being that, you know, it's a way of controlling problematic students. I mean, this is, uh, this is where AI is moving towards and there needs some type of control. So it's important that um, uh, philosophy gives and guides in uh, what kind of ethical principles should AI programs be developed upon. It's, it's, it's crucial. It's, it's imperative. Enrico, perhaps you can tell us a bit even from your experience um, over, the past, over the past years. Um, as a uh, philosopher um, working uh, in, uh, in AI and especially with um, AI companies and technology, um, how, do, how, how do you assess this, this role of philosophers and philosophy um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in that world? Yes. Um... So uh, I'll answer to your question and I'll try to connect uh, to what uh, Francois just said. A um, few points. Uh, the philosophy, uh, just to quote Wittgenstein, give the, um, the riverbed, thanks to ethics, on how, of how we can cope with new technologies and AI. So it's... Uh, is the basic standard that we need. Uh, in the industry of AI, uh, they are looking for philosophers with competences in AI and machine learning because uh, it's quite rare to find philosophers to manage ethical problems. And it's uh, like to go to a hospital and to find only engineers and not doctors. So uh, as uh, education system, we should think of produce or uh, teach more uh, ethical uh, skills around the technology to uh, new philosopher. This, this is the, the point about how philosophy is needed in the industry. But what uh, several points that Francois uh, just uh, um, quoted are the problem of power that uh, AI uh, uh, has and how is this power is used in society. Uh, if you remember what Montesquieu did with the division of power in a state, the same thing we should start to, to do in AI. We don't have the national borders, uh, but we have very big international agents that we could and should regulate to balance this power. Um, I, I, I'm not saying, um, let me be clear, uh, when Twitter um, blocked Trump was right because Trump was using a, an instrument in a wrong way, but it is wrong that Twitter blocked uh, uh, blocked Trump at the same time because it's not his role. Mm -hmm. It's a governmental role. It's another power that you should take this decision. And so in, in a certain way, we need to rebalance power and, uh, and to be very careful on how we are using this uh, instrument, especially in school. That's why I'm, I'm, I, I like uh, to, to, to talk uh, with Francois about it, because in school we are shaping the way uh, students are going to interact with information and with an informational, to an informational world. So if uh, 
we use uh, anti- intelligence artificial um, sorry uh, AI artificial intelligence we risk to uh, use only a statistical way to interact with children or students because I should remember you that artificial intelligence is not intelligent because if Artificial intelligence exists. It exists also artificial stupidity. It's a normal dualism. We are not talking, to, uh, talking about it. So it doesn't exist. It's only a statistical way to do something better. As if we use statistics, we use average. And so the behavior, as uh, Francois said, uh, is standardized. So. In Malta, there is uh, some somebody that are studying how to use artificial intelligence in education. Is Matteo Montebello, and is doing a great job. The point is, are we using as he's doing artificial intelligence to improve and empower the difference, the diversity, or are we using it just to standardize our knowledge and our behavior? That's the great difference. Liberty uh, against industrialization of the behavior and of the knowledge of students. Now, if, I may, if I may continue, in fact, this is the problem with AI that people uh, tend to think of artificial intelligence as something you know, much better or an improved version of human intelligence. But ultimately, Artificial intelligence is designed by humans and it is, there is an element of self-learning. However, it is coded and designed by humans. And more importantly, as Enrico mentioned, the thing about AI is that it relies on the past. It relies on statistics and data that are produced from, uh, from past events, basically. And the inferences and the predictions and the forecasts are based on these past statistics. So what happens? What is happening is that a lot of the AI programs that are being designed are magnifying elements of structural inequality. Uh, To give you an example, if you have a structural inequality where certain ethnic groups are are incarcerated more often than others, because there is an element of structural uh, racism, what AI is going to do is going to look at the statistics, look at percentages, and make an inference that that particular ethnic group is to be considered more dangerous or more prone to delinquency than other ethnic groups. Why? Because AI does not think independently, and it is not designed to think in terms of the values that we as humans are constantly developing. So what it is looking at is only at statistics and numbers. And this is preoccupying because, obviously, who the, the question then comes, who is controlling these programs? Who is controlling um, this technology? I mean, on one hand, you can have um, states, governments that are controlling this technology and using it to maintain their power, as we can see, for example, with the, um, Chinese, with the Chinese state. On the other hand, you have the situation where you have companies which are more powerful than the states themselves nowadays. And we can see that there's this constant tension, for example, between um, tech companies, big tech, and um, both national governments, national states, and also international states, like, for example, the EU. As we can see recently um, with what is happening between big tech and EU and uh, you know, the tension that exists. So it, it, we need to look at it. Who holds the power? I mean, it's not a joke. I mean, we, one needs to look at these elements. Thank, thank, thank you, Francois. I think we, we have a similar vision. Somebody has got perception of the danger, danger, but the danger are there, and we should just mitigate the risk of AI because we need it. But we need to mitigate what Francois was saying, uh, for example, the reinforcement bias, uh, the fact that uh, the learning machine reinforces the knowledge with, uh, with data that are 
in Latin, some uh, past participle, it's in the past, it's uh, something given. But um, if uh, I don't think we have a lot of time, so I would uh, uh, just suggest two kind of action, because uh, if we don't give solutions as a philosopher, we highlight only problems. And I'd like to give you two possible solutions. The first one is that we need, uh, as we are working with For Humanity, uh, independent audit to audit uh, companies, because we can't accept that a company creates an ethical or an algorithm risk committee, and uh, this committee is not evaluated by external uh, uh, entities. So it doesn't work. And, as Google and Facebook showed mm, 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 a lot of time, their committees didn't have any power. So they needed to be audited by an external and independent uh, entity. And the second one is about the university. Uh, I, I was talking just yesterday with the professor of Malta, Alexei Dingley, uh, thanks to Francois for the connection. And, uh, uh, he is uh, working on artificial intelligence in the developing part. And uh, I know uh, quite well Jean-Paul uh, De Luca and he's a philosopher. What we need now is create new kind of ethical CVs, ethical curricula, where uh, philosophers know, start to learn machine learning and developers start to learn ethics. We have to put together and create a new kind of uh, uh, skills, a new kind of uh, classes at university in every university in the world where we are um, forming, teaching to a new generation of, uh, uh, of developer and philosopher that we work together, we learn to work together to mitigate the possible risks of uh, artificial intelligence. No, in fact, as uh, Enrico said, I mean, it's, uh, there are um, frameworks of ethical principles related to AI. Um, the EU has developed one, Malta has developed one as well. So there are these frameworks. Now, it is important that these frameworks are maybe, you know, if need be, they are revised and even uh, but also we need to put it in practice and people need to be educated about these ethical principles. So we need to ensure that the education system in teaches um, both the educators and the learners about what is good technology, what is bad technology, how it should be used and to understand ultimately um, what to look out for because the reality is that we cannot put the onus of technology only on the developers, but we need to also put the onus on the users. So it is crucial that the ethical principles are only not, not only taught to those who are developing these technologies, but also to those people who are using these technologies. So we need, to we need this uh, binary system of um, uh, where we create a more mature, vision and understanding of how technology and AI technology works. Thank you, Francois. Enrico, we're nearing to the close of uh, the time that has been allotted to us for this event, um, which is the Campus Book Festival. So uh, I thought I'd, I'll, uh, I'd ask you about a book you published recently that is Skip. Perhaps you can uh, tell us something about it. It is available um, uh, for purchase online, but um, I'd like to invite you to tell us something about your book. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll uh, take the opportunity to show the cover because uh, I know that uh, you didn't have there. But um, so uh, this book is uh, as published in Italian, English and French, and it's uh, a kind of voyage a, a trip that I did in managing information technology projects in my career. Uh, at the beginning, I, start, I wanted to do an, a book on how to manage projects in IT with information in general. And at the end, it became a philosophical book on time 
because the point uh, at the beginning was how to better manage projects. And at the end, uh, I concluded that maybe we should know uh, when we shouldn't do a project, when should we should avoid the project. And uh, the, the title is The Art of Avoiding Project, an Ecological Way of Living in the Information Age. Uh, before I told you that uh, we, have, we are producing a lot of data and we are producing also a lot of software. And I know that everybody that cope with administration use several software and feels like it's working, is a slave of the system. And we have to change this, producing new software just with a good way, but avoiding to produce every kind of software we could. So it's a kind of the Razor Docam, it's a kind of knife that uh, allowed us to, 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 to cook, uh, to choose which kind of project we should do. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Enrico. I think we're, uh, we're at the end of our, uh, of our conversation. I'll just perhaps uh, ask both of you whether you'd like to make any final comments before wrapping up. Um, Francois? No, I mean, it, it's important that we have more of these kind of discussions and that these discussions are, uh, and, and I thank the Book Council for organizing this because through this medium, even the fact that, let's look at you know, the opportunities that technology offers, the fact that this will be uh, available online for people to follow means that maybe there will be a wider audience and hopefully maybe the discussion will be wider because Ultimately, this is how change can happen. Change can happen if there is a democratization of the process where we have a more informed public. And therefore, it's important that these discussions are more widespread and more available. Yes, I think uh, exactly the same. We should democratize these uh, dialogues. And uh, I, I'd be honest with you, I've been a philosopher for a long time, but in the industry, I generally didn't tell to people that I was a philosopher because it wasn't well accepted in the ICT sector. And it's just a few years that I'm proud to be a philosopher because never I felt to be so necessary for the cause and development of the system. So it's, I think we are, we are entering a new, new period where philosophers are necessary. And so uh, your work at the Faculty of Philosophy, it will be very necessary for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Enrico. Um, on, the, on the bright side, things are moving because we've, uh, we've just introduced a, a new study unit in our program of studies, which Francois would be um, coordinating on uh, ethics, AI and technology. Uh, we also hope to keep developing other cooperations, including, of course, with Enrico, who, as I said at the beginning, we really do hope to see again in Malta to continue uh, what was very abruptly um, stopped his, uh, his uh, visit here last, last year. But uh, I'll join Francois uh, and Enrico in thanking the National Book Council for this opportunity. It's, uh, it was a, it's always a pleasure to collaborate now for a couple of years with the National Book Council uh, with events for the Campus Book Festival. And uh, on behalf of the department, I'd also like to thank uh, Francois and Enrico for joining us for this conversation.